everyone. Welcome to Risk Roundup. Digital disruption is here. Financial industry has made a confident move towards artificial intelligence based machines. Humans across nations are on the brink of a very visible artificial intelligence arms race. The use of artificial intelligence, in short referred to as AI, is not new. From cars to phones to thermostats, emails and games like checkers and chess have been using basic artificial narrow intelligence, in short referred to as ANI, for a very long time. More advanced ANI systems are also being widely used across various industries like finance, military and also manufacturing. As the AI arms race intensifies across nations, its government, industries, organizations, and academia, in short referred to as NGI rate, intelligent non-human systems continue to develop rapidly. There are visible signs that finance industry is keeping up with the AI arms race and has taken a decisive step forward in moving away from man towards machines. As we speak, digital traders are replacing human traders and fortunes are being lost and made in a matter of milliseconds. Manual trading is being replaced by high frequency computerized trading. Human jobs are being replaced by machine jobs. The role of man is basically being replaced by machines. The role of human is obviously diminishing as the world of finance moves towards AI based machines. When the role of human is facing an existential threat, it is important to evaluate the critical security risk each one of us faces across NGIOA in not only today, but also in the coming tomorrow. To discuss this further, I'm delighted to welcome Samir Vasavna from AI Labs. Samir is co-founder and CEO of Artificial Intelligence Labs based in San Francisco, California. Welcome Samir, we are delighted to have you on Risk Rounder. Yeah, thank you so much for having me as well. I'm uh, delighted to uh, join you and discuss this very interesting field that uh, is going to yield some major change within uh, within the world as a whole, but the, the finance industry in specific um, as being uh, kind of a major impact um, Wonderful. here. So uh, Wonderful. thank you so much for having me. Great, Samir. So as we, the humans, individually and collectively aim for broader capabilities, Beyond our very narrow human intelligence, the rise of artificial intelligence is creating complex security challenges that will likely be beyond our human capabilities to manage. There are reports that millions have been lost due to computer glitch and software problems. These events have raised serious doubts about the stability of computerized trading systems. There are many who feel that AI-based trading systems has made financial markets more volatile, has it? So I would say that it has made markets much more volatile, but I wouldn't necessarily call those AI-based trading systems. So those are what you're referring to as high-frequency trading systems. Most of those are statistically um, statistically based using certain types of quant models um, in correlation with certain types of different data. Um, they're usually trading on volume of a stock. They're not looking at anything relative to the stock, which is making it harder to raise capital for these companies. And it's it's been kind of changing um, how the trading patterns of most companies work. Um, it, it, because it's kind of manipulating volume in correlation to some events. Um, in some cases, some of the uh, higher end hedge funds are being able to actually implement um, AI and different types of sentiment models and things there. But um, right now, uh, the reason behind um, why a lot of these systems aren't working too well is because of the fact that they're not necessarily AI. And AI in this space has not been even close to perfected. It's only 1% the way there. Um, there is a, quite a bit that needs to be done in order to have something perfected. Um, but these statistical systems um, can be triggered and there, there could be errors within these, within these systems um, if uh, they're all attacking one stock at once or they're attacking um, volume in, in a bad way or the quant who is actually developing these algorithms um, wrote something improperly and they executed trades that um, relative to the algorithm. I mean, there's all kinds of different things that could go wrong in this they, space they and it costs a lot of money to uh, maintain. That's for sure. But um, a big part of this is maintenance and there are hedge funds 
hiring hundreds and hundreds of different quants. I mean, high frequency trading firms hiring hundreds of these guys to make sure these algorithms work. You know, a big thought of mine when applying artificial intelligence to high frequency trading would be the maintenance process. Um, if a system is able to work autonom autonomously um, without having that maintenance and be able to work around those issues, analyzing things that are not necessarily what they're currently looking at um, being just volume, then um, I think it might open up some room for a, a less failure. Yes, yes. So there is, I mean, obviously there is a lot that still needs to be done. It is still in the preliminary stages, but uh, that's a, that is a good explanation, Samir. So now with the hope that AI-based analytical systems can automatically recognize changes in the markets and adapt and adjust in ways that rigid quantitative models cannot, there seems to be great effort put towards machine learning. What is the current state of AI-based analytical systems for financial markets? So the thing is, is that right now machine learning in the finance markets is a big no-no. I was actually talking with um, the uh, head of machine learning at Bloomberg, um, and he was telling us that um, we should be staying away right now from uh, implementing machine learning into the entire aspect of uh, a financial analysis, but certain areas of it that are highly aimed. You can't have a machine learning based model um, be the entirety of uh, creating a financial decision. It has to be a combination of uh, quantitative finance models and, and statistical models um, in correlation with certain machine learning models. Because see, the thing is, is um, machine learning is a nonlinear technique. And uh, in finance, it usually requires um, more linear techniques, um, which are more in line with quant models and, and everything else. But um, in certain areas like stock selection, after the criteria has been models and everything else have been done, um, when that's an area where machine learning can be applied more so than uh, um, determining risk and, and other areas like that. No, I'm glad to know about that, that they have a combination of you know, both the systems. Now, from across financial fund management to high frequency trading, there is a great effort being made to quickly understand, evaluate, and forecast things before they develop and happen. It seems that the efforts are more towards speed of action. Is speed the center of financial industry's uh, AI strategy? So that's not, uh, when I get, get more into what my startup is doing and what we're working on, we're not focusing on speed at all. Uh, it's more about long-term investments. There, there are several different classes of um, investments and um, high frequency investments where you're kind of in a position for less than a second to gain a small, small fraction of a cent um, as a uh, return isn't necessarily where AI should be focused. Um, more so in the long-term direction of how investments and long-term type portfolios. Um, but um, yes, getting uh, data quickly is uh, very important. Um, these high frequency trading firms and uh, hedge funds are putting a huge emphasis while they're doing um, high frequency trading on getting their data before everyone else. And this comes at a uh, extremely high price. Um, that being having servers close to the major stock exchanges and um, having people on site working on those algorithms. Um, it's very, very costly, but um, it can yield much higher results um, because of that. Um, the other thing is, is that um, pulling out news data and, and sentiment data before the general public has access to it gives them kind of a slight benefit over anyone else um, in these markets so they can trade on that information before um, the rest of the market can, giving them access to uh, returns. Now, where, where the issue kind of comes into place here is um, if there's multiple firms that are trading on this information, it could cause additional volatility, additional risk um, for other investors as well as those firms themselves. I mean, 80% of trades now in the market are being done by high frequency trading algorithms. And because of this, it, it creates competition amongst these algorithms. I mean, I'm sure you're well uh, familiar with the uh, flash crash. Back then, um, it was uh, definitely some problems relating to uh, volume and, and trading on information quickly, but um, that being correlated to uh, the algorithms and how they, how they were properly developed versus not. 
uh, good to know that. Now, it is reported that official trades are already occurring using AI trading technology. Now, AI now seemingly determines what to buy, when and how, and also it also tells when to sell, reduce exposure to that you know particular investment and so on. So is this technology at currently for private use or any individual or any entity can use it for their benefit you know from uh, any nation? Is it proprietary technology? Yeah, so oh. it, this is extremely proprietary technology and what we're trying to do is take some of this technology, enhance it a little bit and apply it to people that would never get that get access to this technology and this technology is is trade i mean they're trade secrets of these top hedge funds top investment banks that are developing them um they are extremely costly to, to develop and um, they give these banks and hedge funds a, a complete edge but um they are they're proprietary to these funds no one is ever going to see those besides those people in the funds um companies like de shaw um what was Ray, Ray Dalio's fund, um, uh, Bridgewater Associates, um, Barclays, all these guys are, they're working on these proprietary systems for, um, for trading and they're able to reduce their exposure with these investments due to this fact. Um, a major area that we've been focusing on um, at Sentient Technologies has been as well as a sentiment and analyzing sentiment of stocks. So currently, um, they're analyzing Twitter and stock Twitter sentiment and seeing, okay, well, negative stock sentiment here. Um, the rest of the market isn't really going to know about this right now until these reports come out or whatnot. Um, we've already been able to calculate this information. Let's trade out of it. So they've just reduced their exposure significantly because if sentiment of a stock comes out or, or fraud allegations come out and they're able to determine this before the rest of the Um, I'm sorry. I think the, I think the thing cut up. Um, if they're able to uh, determine that before the rest of the market can, um, they are uh, able to uh, create a much bigger advantage for these firms, and uh, it's causing issues for not just um, retail investors and, and people like that, and and the companies in specific, but it's causing issues for other hedge funds and, and smaller investment firms because these guys don't have the same competitive edge. They don't have um, the advantages these other firms have. Right, right. No, that that is that is very true. Now, so how does this AI-based digital trader or digital trading understand and devise strategy for stock investment? What goes on behind the scene? So, um, in, in the case of our system, it's not necessarily devising a strategy. It's um, it's usually the team around it that devises a strategy, but it executes off of it. Um, so with a plethora of different types of models and uh, uh, different types of models and different types of uh, ways of analyzing a stock that are geared towards that um, firm and their existing strategies and um, their client. So um, in the case of our software, the client uh, implements the risk and their, um, their projected returns and uh, their current portfolio, all kinds of different, their time frame, and the system correlates that to different types of models and uh, factors in different types of stock sentiment around what those models are looking at in, in terms of stocks. And then uh, it does all kinds of different types of uh, analysis, similar to how a manual research analyst would do so. Um, analyzing um, earnings reports, analyzing um, 10K forms and all kinds of stuff like that, um, new sentiments, um, the financial health of a company, all kinds of things like that. But quite frankly, it's really just comparing it to how a, uh, how a human analyst would do it, but analyzing a lot more data, a lot quicker and a lot more types of data. So there's not really anything too special about how it devises investment strategies because really it's based off of how a human does it. It's really automating that. I see. Got and, uh, action. Yes. Now, there are some who say that deep learning algorithms have become a commodity because everyone can, you know, develop that from, you know, any part of the world. And if everyone is developing it or using it, its predictions will be priced into the market because it's not just like, you know, the development of AI is uh, 
you know, specific to only few people here in the United States, or, you know, only few people can do that. Anyone can do that all across the nation. So the question is, that is the AI community concerned about the universality, affordability, and accessibility of AI-driven products to anyone and everyone? Because how you are developing right now, Sami, you and your partners and at your startup, similar, you know, a lot of other startups could be, you know, developing similar products too. So we think of AI as uh, two different categories. There's AI focused on driving existing solutions, uh, existing academic um, solutions and all kinds of different solutions that are um, created by major companies and applying that to a space that really needs applying to like finance or a certain aspect of finance. And then there are the companies that develop um, revolutionary new technologies um, bordering artificial general intelligence and all kinds of things there or even improved deep, deep learning algorithms and, and they're not necessarily applying it to a space but they're really developing it for the technology and then they're exiting out of that technology typically selling it to a firm or a company like Google or, or, uh, or Facebook but um, we think that um, it's not just about the algorithm, it's about uh, the application of that algorithm. And it's also about the, uh, the um, data that that algorithm is, uh, is working with. Because an algorithm is only as important as the data that it's working with and it's, it's analyzing. And uh, given that, um, it's a lot more complicated than simply just putting some uh, open source algorithms together and building a, uh, a startup out of it. I mean, it's a, it's not necessarily that simple because for a system like ours, it requires 20, 30, 40 different types of algorithms simultaneously working together. Now this is taking um, a significant time of academic research, man hours, I mean, and high level employees. It's not something that a software development team in India can simply whip together um, like a traditional app or website. It uh, tends, to, tends to be a little bit harder, especially when you're working with an extremely complicated field like, uh, like AI. So. Um, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily as much of a commodity as people think. I think companies that are trying to build those algorithms into commodities um, and uh, allow startups to use that at a cost um, and implement that into their products to create a more data-driven environment, I think that's definitely um, a major benefit um, rather, than a, uh, rather than a flaw. Um, Yes, yes, of course. So, uh, yeah. Now, it, let's talk about your startup, AI Labs. It seems that you have developed technology called FSAI that will change the entire asset management sector by replacing manual trading practices with automated workflows using, uh, of course, AI. Could you explain FSAI and its fundamentals? Yeah, so we're actually changing the name to Vise now, but... Um, mm -hmm. It is uh, pretty interesting. So in the asset management industry, in the wealth management space, there are um, advisory brokers, wealth managers, financial advisors, RIAs, these guys, and they're creating uh, customized investment solutions for clients. And um, they're not necessarily creating customized investment solutions for clients. That's, that seems to be the issue. Um, it's, it's, it's costly overhead of actually devising these solutions. It's um, it's expensive for uh, outsourcing these solutions to mutual funds, and thus they're having to raise their fees significantly, and they are having to uh, lose clients. They're becoming a dying industry. And we figured, well, how can we apply AI to this to replace, um, re replace what they're doing now and give them a, a cost-effective alternative to uh, building investment solutions for their clients? So we created a system called Vise that... Um, takes a client's criteria into, into account and builds them a uh, customized investment solution meeting their criteria exactly um, and then manages that solution for them. But see, the interesting part is, is we're giving this to the advisors and we're not giving it to the uh, clients, the end users. So um, the uh, advisors can give better investment advice to their clients. Um, it's a more um, effective and sustainable business model. And um, we can kind of prevent the uh, industry from kind of dying out, given the fact that we're going to be able to significantly reduce their fees whilst um, um, improving their investment advice. So a client now only has to walk into an advisor's office and say, okay, I've got $200,000 to invest. My risk tolerance is um, X. 
and uh, I've got a, a time frame of 30 years. And rather than the advisor saying, okay, I'll put you in a mutual fund or oh, I'll, I'll get back to you in uh, four to six weeks with a portfolio, the advisor simply has to type this into, a, uh, into our system. And the system gives them out a list of stocks, risk, um, risk levels on these stocks, data behind the stocks and justification. It explains why you're gonna buy these stocks and why you wanna invest in this portfolio. And then um, it manages these stocks. So for example, we like to pick on this one, um, Valiant Pharmaceuticals, fraud allegations came out about that early last year, I believe. And um, traditionally, um, if an advisor had a couple hundred positions of, of client assets into, um, into Valiant, and they're not constantly watching these portfolios and constantly managing them, they wouldn't realize until later that they're losing a bunch of money and um, their clients are gonna be unhappy. But in our case, um, they would have gotten a notification saying, okay, well, there's fraud allegations that just came out. Their sentiment is going to go down a little while. Here's what happens because we're bringing this data to them faster. They're able to move their clients out, mitigate the risk, and uh, provide uh, happy clients. So um, they no longer have to uh, focus on actually managing their investments. Our system does that for them. The... Um, and they just have to please their clients. And uh, we're even helping with that because we developed a chat bot um, in which we'll send out the client constant notifications about their portfolio to show that their advisor truly cares about their portfolio and they're actually watching for them. Nice. And, uh, it really doesn't take too much time on the part of the advisor. Right. And that, that's, a, I mean, at this point, like you said, you are giving, you are not giving it to individual buyers. You are just giving it to the advisors, but there is no guarantee it will just stay with the advisors. These things, you know, uh, are not going to be very secretive. It sooner or later is going to go in everyone's hand. Can you talk about the technical foundations of uh, why is that you, you have developed? Uh, it's not FSAI now, like you said, it's, uh, you have changed the name to WISE. So what is the technical foundation? So um, I can't tell you too much, but I can tell you a little bit. Um, we're applying similar technologies that hedge funds use, but we're also applying uh, different types of alternative technologies that are uh, are modular around any kind of investment strategy and any kind of uh, any type of different clients. Um, the major point of this is providing customized investment advice. So we're impl employing certain types of genetic algorithms and artificial neural networks um, for determining certain aspects of risk, but. Um, a major, and we're actually working in correlation with quantitative finance models. So um, we can have a little bit of a um, kind of similarity to kind of what the market is offering right now. Um, so there's not too much variable in the system, but we're still providing a, a significant amount of uh, AI exposure as well. But um, a major focus for us has been sentiment analysis. Um, we've been developing out a uh, a, uh, different types of uh, sentiment models utilizing natural language processing, which is a very hot a area in AI right now. Um, we're actually able to determine um, sentiment of a stock m much better than they traditionally are, because traditionally they've been looking at um, just words, sentiment words, um, and, and the connotation behind those words in um, Twitter tw or tweets and uh, stock tweets. But um, what we're doing is we're actually able to pull sentiment from um, what you'd expect to be unbiased reports related to the SEC and, and those, the, their filings with them. And we're also being able to pull um, this from uh, actually injecting uh, different types of SEO analysis into um, these models. So we can actually be watching um, how the, the uh, direct sentiment of a uh, news article and how that'll affect the stock because of how many people that have read that news article so um, if there's a news article. That is very interesting. So how yeah. does that identify? You look at the keywords or how do you that, define that? That's what's very interesting about our algorithms. We're not necessarily looking at the keyboard keywords. We're looking at full sentences. We're understanding full sentiments or se uh -huh. sentences, which is a huge revolution, although it may not sound like one in um, sentiment no, analysis. I, I, I hear you on that. It is, I think, very huge because that way based on the emotions, of the investors or individuals or the market, you the algorithms would be able to catch that and you know be able to adapt and uh, make a decision according. That is really big. So, at what stage are you in that development? So that's the thing. We've made our most progress in terms of uh, the sentiment analysis. That's where we've got our resources focused. 
Um, it's also an area where it's a little bit more clouded um, on the institutional side of things um, with the hedge funds. They're focusing a lot on there, but what they're really looking at is tweets and uh, biased information. We're looking at unbiased information and pulling sentiment off of that, which is much more accurate in the eyes of the investor than looking at tweets. Because although a million people might send out tweets about a stock, if 10 million people read an article about a stock from a credible source, it's going to make wage much more of a uh, change than uh, the tweets will. So, and especially because of its, uh, because it's uh, unbiased information. So there's that, but um, in terms of the, um, the uh, analyzing the financial health of a company and, and things there, um, we're doing some pretty interesting stuff, actually um, looking at company culture. Traditional uh, top analyst, uh, buy side analyst, will we'll look at culture um, when, um, when looking at whether or not to buy stock. This is a major area of focus for us. Um, we're able to provide um, company culture details to uh, advisors. So when um, someone is looking at a stock, they're gonna say, okay, what's the culture of the company? How's management doing? How's the CEO approval? We've got databases with thousands of interviews of employees and, uh, and uh, thoughts on the CEO and how management is doing and the interworkings of the company because it's noted that, um, that um, Companies with good culture typically outperform companies with bad culture or mediocre culture between two and 3.28%. So um, being able to analyze this provides a major um, advantage in terms of the uh, portfolios that we're offering to clients than uh, traditionally just looking at the uh, financial health of a company. Um, but, that is uh, very that's, that's very interesting, Samir. Where did you get the data that company culture uh, you know, impacts the uh, performance. I mean, that that is a really very interesting, and I would like to know more about it. And what you also said about that, you know, based on the sentiment, sentiment analysis. I mean, there has been research already done that if uh, there is a lot of fear in the market, uh, some event happens like you know terrorist attack or anything, the people get scared and they you know sell all their stocks. That is already proven. So what you are what your strategy is about sentiment analysis, I think it's right on and it's very uh, interesting. I would like to know more as you progress, how your development is shaping up. But uh, tell me about this, you know, company culture, because I never read uh, anything on that, that, you know, company culture impacts, you know, their performance as far as the stock, you know. So I, I happen to know, um, I don't know if you've seen the big short, but I happen to know um, a major uh, analyst, a housing analyst, who uh, is probably one of the top housing analysts in the world. And uh, she was the one that called the top and bottom of the housing market and sold that uh, research. She had spoken with me about how she analyzes the stock and she was talking about the financial health of the company and, and um, the health um, in terms of uh, how uh, outside prospects think of the company and the, the long-term prospects of the company. But she focused a lot on determining the inside scoop. And she said, well, if you create an AI system, it'll never be able to uh, replace me or anything like that because it's never going to be able to determine the inside scoop on a company. I can go talk mm -hmm. to a few employees and talk to the CEO. But right. I said, well, maybe there's a solution around that. And now I'm able to analyze 4,000 employees, their thoughts on the company, CEO, and get unbiased information versus her who will get information and get the inside scoop on a company, but she'll be talking with the CEO. When you talk with the CEO of a company, the information is obviously biased. So he said, CEO wants, wants to put the company in a good light. So uh, in this case, we're able to get a better scoop on management coming from the company's employees um, and uh, their culture than, um, than a traditional analyst would, which is what puts, despite what people thought about this, um, and that humans finding information out on company culture puts them at an advantage. It's actually AI finding about company culture that puts a major advantage over that because we're able to provide better information than humans can. But furthermore, the way we found this information, um, there was a uh, article, I think you, you know, relating to the statistics on Harvard Business Review um, that discussed the Forbes top 100 companies to work for that um, annually progressed by 2 to 3.28% um, above um, industry standard. And um, our, our statistics might be a little bit higher um, relating to a company because culture because zeroing in directly in the most culture fit companies and, and, and things there. But um, 
it is definitely an interesting space and it definitely puts portfolios at an advantage because if employees are happier, they're going to work better than whether or not employees are unhappy. I think yes, absolutely, which is very interesting. Are there any other startups doing similar work like you or, you know, other companies that are in a better, you know, more advanced state who have, who are developing similar products? What about your competitors? So um, it's pretty interesting. A lot of our, uh, the way we look at the market is there are tools, uh, statistical tools for analyzing small aspects of stocks that already exist and have existed for years, CRM tools and, and things there. And then there are the robo advisors. We don't consider them necessarily competition because we're giving out equities. They're giving out ETFs and a ratio between ETFs and bonds, which is not necessarily in the best interest of the client, but they're definitely an alternative. Um, in terms of direct competition, um, there's no direct competition in our direct positioning of the software because we're positioning it towards financial advisors and people like that. But um, in terms of uh, people that are working on similar types of things, um, DE Shaw and major hedge funds are working on similar software. Uh, more related on the sentiment side of things, Sentient Technology and, and a few other AI firms are working on um, <clears throat> on specific AI platforms that are related to sentiment. But these guys, everyone's positioning their software towards the high end of the market. Now, the high end of the market, and can show, of course, but the high end of the market is um, is extremely crowded. So although there may be solutions like this at the higher end of the market, that are focusing on one major aspect like sentiment or like a, the, or like a financial health or a, well, th things like that that are directed. They're focusing on hedge funds and major banks while we're focusing on the lower end of the market, which is subsequently a bigger market. And it's, um, it gives us market movers advantage, but it's also um, an easier to capture market because when we're able to provide a compage to these financial advisors at a low price, Yes, yes, now that so it seems, so it seems. Now, you think that the product that you have developed, Vice, would be able to help replace research divisions or research analysis role completely? Or would, would there still be a need for a human factor in that? So in terms of financial advisors, I wouldn't say so. I don't think that there's going to be, a, there's right now there isn't a human factor in it. Um, I, I hate to admit this, but I've spoken with a lot of financial advisors and uh, there's not much of a human factor in, um, in um, manual research on these portfolios. So I don't think there will be, um, but in terms of the institutional side of things and the hedge funds, I think there will still be a, uh, a human factor in some of the research, maybe fact checking or double checking at least for a few years until they can get comfortable with these AIs. And then, um, uh, and then I think that uh, there won't be much of one. I think it's going to be more focused on client relations, business development, things there. Sure, sure, of course. Now, let's talk about the security parameters. What you are developing is basically a software, right? I mean, it is AI-based software. So what security parameters are incorporated in the design phase? How are you ensuring that, you know, your clients or whoever, you know, uses your product wise, that, you know, the security is built into that and you know they would not be vulnerable to the security challenges so what's interesting about our system is that there's not much proprietary client data that we have to worry about too much so most of it is public data anyways um but it's still providing a major advantage we're still using bank level encryption and whatnot to provide the client data that's already in there real worry is um is in, in AI in specific is for these hedge funds that are taking proprietary client and, and their own research data. Um, they're having to implement um, above usual standard uh, um, encryption or tactics and, um, and all kinds of different uh, methods of, uh, of securing this data. Um, in our case, it's not necessarily the biggest concern just because of the fact that uh, we're not doing any of the trading we're providing the advice but the advisor has to do the trading through a separate platform so it's their concern to worry about the security of that um so uh, there's no kind of ways of of losing no, money I, understand or, I understand your point Sami, that you are using the public data so that that way you are safe but if there is a if your product wise the software when you know the clients are using and these are all large financial firms if they're using it and if there is a security gap in your software 
through which any hackers can get entry into the you know the client system that's where the security challenges may lie you may not be having your own data to worry about but you of course have to worry about how secure your system is so that you know whoever is using is they are not vulnerable because of the security gaps that you know any hacker can use to get entry into the client system well yeah i mean that's for sure i mean we're using double bit encryption and all kinds of different things um double stage um authentication and and um we're using some uh, unusual security standards uh for protecting that but um, in terms of uh, the security risks, um, right now, the way we're doing it is if a hacker were to gain entry in the system, there wouldn't be much for them to gain, um, just given the fact that they would have the client portfolios and everything and see what holdings the clients have, but they wouldn't be able to sell the holdings or um, tamper with the holdings. Um, and there, there isn't that proprietary accessible because that's held on a different system. It's held on the broker's trading system bank level security um it's not permanently held on our system it's transported it over to uh, their system because we don't do the trading on our own no sure i understand that even though you don't do any of those you know uh, very sensitive uh, business processes but at the same time you your software your algorithm will be part of their you know computers and their systems and anything that is a part of this such you know critical infrastructure of any nation that makes them you know vulnerable if this system is not secure then that makes them vulnerable and because ai as ai algorithms are designed to make high stake decisions in real time just like any application any software implementing ai is not different from any other software and for this very reason it could be affected by security vulnerabilities that we've been talking about so hackers would be they never you know it's not that they you know try to target the financial firms by attacking just the financial firm uh, software or their system, they try to get entry through you know other vendors, other you know softwares uh, that the financial system is using. So uh, this could be one of that example. So that's why a cyber attack against AI system or your uh, product that you have developed, wise could cause serious damage due to the nature of this system. So uh, if how, what kind of testing do you go through to make sure? that you know it will not be vulnerable so we're doing a, a some different types of testing um a major aspect of this and the way we look at security is not necessarily external threats because we've already implemented bank level security to cover external threats um covering internal threats um it is definitely a uh, plausible issue and uh there's different types of uh authentication techniques and and everything um, internally to the system that uh, we're worried about the other thing is is the ability to access and open different files so um we were thinking about a multi-stage authentication technique for opening up some of this storage space where these clients uh, where this public or this private client information is contained within our system um through a uh through different types of security standards such as offering a such as uh, making sure that that uh, information can only be opened by a certain user with certain credentials um, on in a certain location by a certain machine um, um, with uh, potential other um, for higher security standards um, requiring authentication for another device versus uh, uh, we're even looking to biometric um, authentication as well um, we think that's going to be a little bit longer of a uh, a path to be taking um, right now versus uh, versus uh, later in the future because it is a quite a costly expense. Yes, for yes, sure. Yes, it is. Security is costly, but the managing security risk at this point is much better than you know managing the crisis later on. So, tell me, Samir, what other products or what other initiatives you all are working at AI Labs other than these ones? So we were originally working on a mobile solution. As I said, my partner and I, we, we did start out pretty young, but um, our uh, first uh, platform was in uh, mobile and mobile app development. We started working on a platform called Syscat, 
built in uh, mobile in the mobile, mobile development space. But we decided to put that platform on a hold to focus more or less on the uh, financial services software. But the one thing that we are doing, um, because of the fact that we've got a very experienced team and a very experienced network of uh, PhDs and uh, high level uh, development talent in AI, we are starting to do consulting um, within AI. So uh, clients um, um, with uh, wanting to hear kind of about the effects that AI is going to wage on different industries, um, anywhere from investment clients and, and people like that versus to startups that are actually looking for uh, development help and uh, things of that nature um, into, uh, into AI. So if they're working on a platform and they want to implement a, AI to help out with certain types of uh, decisions or a certain process in the software. Um, we have a consulting team that's uh, highly qualified in the space to actually develop out these solutions. Yeah, so you, how many people are there on, working on that team? There's about 15. 15, that is good. So uh, Sunny, it looks like you know this initiative is great and uh, what you all are working towards, that's also great, you know, and it looks like you're uh, you all know what you are, where you are, where you want to go, and uh, what efforts are required. So this seems very interesting. Uh, what kind of investment uh, is pouring into AI labs? So Rudik and I did self-fund. My co-founder and I self-funded for for a while, um, but we're doing a uh, about two million dollar raise um, to uh, cover a lot of it. But what we were lucky in doing is uh, we had access to capital, um, which was able to cover some initial development. And um, we had a network um, and able to, able to build the team up and able to get some sales orders and whatnot in to uh, actually fund this company um, up until this point. So uh, we've got a product and we've got traction behind that product. So we're kind of well suited to come in for uh, the investment round. So two, two things are going on simultaneously. You have this product and you also are doing consulting. So if I'm uh, yes. understood correctly, wonderful. So uh, Samir, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate that to, you found time to come from your, you know, this busy startup schedule is so, you know, crazy in spite of that you came and, you know, took time to talk about your initiative, talk about, you know, the artificial intelligence in general and how it could uh, help the financial industry and also the security challenges that it brings. So I'm sure that, you know, our global viewers and listeners who are, interested in knowing about artificial intelligence and how they are moving towards digital disruption, how they are, you know, changing, shifting the role of man towards machine. I'm sure they all will find uh, this very useful. So thank you for that, Samir. Right. Thank you so much for having me. I had a uh, wonderful time. I hope you guys got some insights into uh, a little bit more of AI into finance. Great, wonderful summit. So now if the safety, security, and sustainability of individuals and entities across nations is government industries, organizations, and academia is to be achieved, it is vital to evaluate the independent and collective NGIOA advances in science and technologies. This is to determine the impact and to compute the consequences of science and technological decisions each individual and entity across NGI will take independently and collectively on the future development of society. While the ability to create complex uh, autonomous intelligent robots with perception, cognition and uh, action able to coexist with humans can be viewed as the ultimate and most challenging goal of artificial intelligence. It is important to understand its impact on nations, its government, industries, organizations, and academia. Risk Group Cybersecurity Risk Research Center and Strategic Security Risk Research Center are created for this very reason to identify, evaluate, and manage the risk facing NGIOA in CGS, that means cyberspace, geospace, and space, and discuss, debate, and define necessary frameworks, structural processes, tools, and technologies to manage the security risk of not only the digital global age, but also the coming technological super convergence. We at Risk Group believe that risk management, security, and peace walk together hand in hand. Though security is related to management of threats and peace to the management of conflict, risk management is related to management of security vulnerabilities, as well as management of conflict, and it is not possible to conceive any one of the three without the existence of the other two. All three concepts feed into each other. 
We believe that the security we build for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secure for everyone across nations. Tradition becomes our security, so if we build a culture of managing risk effectively, it will lead us to security and security will lead us to peace. Let's manage the existing and emerging risk together. For more information on the risk roundups, to watch the risk roundup videos or to hear the risk roundup podcast, please go to riskgroupbalancy.com. And do not forget to subscribe and share. Until next time, I'm Jayashree Pandya, host of Risk Roundup, signing off. See you next time. Thank you.